Okay, thanks. So let's start like in a yoga class. So take a deep breath. And while you're doing that, think about all the material that enters your body as you're breathing. Um, first of all, let's say if you breathe about half a liter of, of air each breath, there will be about 10 to the 21, that means 1,000 billion billions of oxygen molecules that enter your lungs. And as you probably know, these molecules are absolutely necessary for you to stay alive, right? You need them to keep going. And you exchange them in your lungs to CO2 molecules, carbon dioxide molecules that you want to get rid of. Okay, so besides these gas phase molecules, each breath that you take also contains small particulate matter uh, chunks. So basically uh, liquid or solid particles that consist of different chemical components like sulfate or black carbon. And let's say in that half a liter of air that you breathe, there are probably some millions of these small particulate phase pollutants. And as you breathe, these particulates, they deposit in different parts of your lungs. So in your nose, in your respiratory tract, even in the alveoli where, where you also do the gas exchange. And they influence your health because more, many, many of these particles, they actually stay in your lungs, stay in your body. Although some of them you exhale as well. Okay, so while you're thinking about this as you are breathing, you can also think about the fact that you breathe in, say, a few tens of thousands of times a day and out of course as well. So, so if you think about the amount of material that passes through your lungs that you exchange with this air that we are surrounded by each day, it's quite a considerable amount. And if you think of it that way, you're probably also convinced that whatever goes into your body will probably have an impact on your health, right? Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that, uh, that what you breathe in will influence your health and your body. But let's take a moment to think about how we, or you, influence the air that we all breathe. Let's do it that way that, that we think, each of you think for a while, small things that you've done today. And I can list what I've done today. So. I've eaten breakfast and lunch. Um, there was probably some, some pieces of ingredients on my plate that were transported from somewhere outside of Sweden. Uh, I've also taken the public transportation here earlier today into my office as well. Um, I'm using electricity now. I'm also wearing clothes and using different kinds of equipment that someone made in some factory for me. And all these actions, are actions that somehow involve all of these that I mentioned, for instance, that, that involve use of energy or burning of some sort or some mechanical wear. And these actions um, put material into the atmosphere that wouldn't be there otherwise. Okay, so if we now take it from our individual little actions to the real big scale, to the global scale, you can think about the fact that there are now seven billion on us um, on this planet at the moment, all doing these kind of little actions that I just described. So you can also imagine that we probably influence also what is in this air that we all breathe, although we cannot see it. And one point that I want to make is that actually the population in the world, you've probably seen that before, has really exploded um, in a relatively short time. So if we compare the situation now to the situation before the Industrial Revolution in 1750 or so, um, in that time before the Industrial Revolution there was about 1 billion of us and now there's 7 billion of us. And in between there's only 10 generations. It's a really short time. And now if you imagine how fast we have multiplied, how fast um, the kind of the actions that we are doing have, have uh, increased, we keep on putting material into the atmosphere. It's probably not so difficult to understand that we've also changed the composition of the air that we breathe. And this is in fact well known. So since the pre-industrial time, 
there is about 50% more of the carbon dioxide, which is the most important greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, in the air that we breathe. And also, especially in the urban areas, there is a lot of these small particulate phase pollutants that we breathe in and that stay in our lungs. Okay, and then you might wonder whether this has had any impact or has any impact. Well, maybe you've heard about climate change or global warming. And this is indeed something that has happened because we have changed the composition of the atmosphere. So we have changed the radiative balance of the Earth and the average temperature of the globe is warming, which means that many of the living environments for, for us humans are changing really fast. And adapting or mitigating this very fast change is a big challenge for us. Although, also in terms of, of the air that we breathe and its impact on our health, um, it's actually something to take seriously. So at the moment, air pollution is really the number one environmental health hazard, globally thinking. Killing several millions of people prematurely uh, each year in global terms. And even in Sweden, it has been estimated that about 5,000 people every year die prematurely because of air pollution, because of something that we don't really see. And to put this number into context, you might want to think about the fact that this is about 20 times more than people dying in traffic accidents. Okay, so this is all very kind of depressing stuff. But I have some good news as well. And the good news is that actually a lot of the, a lot of the activities that are responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, like carbon dioxide emissions, also emit these small particles or air pollutants in general. Okay, so what's so good about that? The good thing is that that also allows for crea creating win-win strategies. So creating energy solutions that are, for instance, that are, that are both uh, good for the climate as well as good for the quality of the air that we breathe, preventing these premature deaths. And there is a huge economic incentive actually uh, in there. Because at the moment, at this very moment, there are more and more studies coming out that clearly show that it really pays off to be, be clean uh, if you do the calculation right, accounting for the social costs and the health-related costs, for instance, of, of the different fuels that we're using. Okay, so to kind of conclude, I wanted to point out a few important changes in, the, in our mindsets that are required for us to think air as a resource that we all share and that actually can maintain, protect um, and um, support the life on Earth. That's, that's what it does, just like our life as we are breathing. And the first important change in the mindset that I would like to point out is that I think we need to realize that there is a direct analogy between our health, taking care of our own body, taking care of our home, and taking care of the environment in general. They are pretty much all just different forms of taking care of our health. Just like our body is our home, um, in term, is this the home to our soul or spirit, whatever you want to call it, the physical surroundings or our home to us and our family. The environment is, is the home of the humankind. And all of these, um, these um, aspects are, are um, something that require maybe a little bit of self-discipline today to make good choices today, to prolong your life and to prolong the lives of life of others sometime maybe far in the future. And typically it's not difficult to motivate people to make changes or make choices that uh, improve their lives somewhere in the future if it has to do with their body. People are also very willing to make long-term investments on their homes, so why not on the environment and on the earth? The second important change in mindset that I think is required to really take good care of the air that we breathe is to prioritize. And this is something that someone, everyone has to do for themselves. There is no recipe for this either. So really think about the fact that there are now quite a lot more of us than there was two generations ago sharing the same resources. Whereas a lot of our values in terms of what we think about our relation to consumerism, for instance, uh, is from, let's say, a couple, of a couple of generations ago. 
So I think it's important that all of us, we think, what are the material things that are actually necessary for us to survive and to lead a good life? It's simple. The third point that I would like to make, the third important change in our mindset that's required, is to ditch this kind of old-fashioned way of, of thinking about man versus nature as some kind of a war, where someone is good and someone is bad, and someone is a threat and someone is a victim. Because I don't really believe in neither guilt or fear as a constructive, sustainable uh, source of motivation. But instead, we should acknowledge the fact that we are in constant interaction. We are part of the environments that we live in. We have the power to change the environments that we live in. For instance, we have the power to really change the composition of the air. But also, these changes in the environment influence us back, back in terms of the impact on our body and our health. And to me, this is actually the only picture that somehow is required to convince me of the fact that man is a very important force of nature. This is an image from NASA from a satellite during the night that shows all the beautiful lights that are basically just signs of the human activity. And as you see, this picture is very beautiful, but it's also very clearly showing the impact of, of us humans how we are present everywhere, how we are influencing the environment everywhere on the globe, basically. And also, I hope that I've also shown you that the changes that we make will also influence our lives and our bodies back, just as it is when we are breathing. Thanks. <laughs>